uh, we are connected. Got it. And, uh, and we're so grateful. Um, we're grateful for this time. So maybe we, we start by saying uh, a prayer, just um, you know, acknowledging that this is holy ground. And so we're just going to take a moment to check our hearts uh, in preparation, um, just as Moses stood um, outside of uh, the burning bush and uh, the Lord God told him, uh, take off your sandals because the ground you're standing on is holy. So we, we come into that sense, spiritual sense of checking our hearts and um, maybe the sandals represented the dirt uh, of this earth, the dirt that we carry with us, the dirt that carry us, right? Sandals may have a, a lot of different interpretations, but uh, the other ones that get a hold of all the dirt, uh, so then we can, we can be uh, cleansed, you know, and, and it's so crucial that uh, when Peter wanted God to, to wash him, uh, not only just his feet, if you remember that story, he also wanted his, his hands and his body uh, washed, Peter or John. Anyway, somebody wanted their whole their whole body washed, but uh, Jesus said, no, it's only just your feet. It's only your feet that are dirty. So we come into God's holy presence and we're so grateful for this time, uh, this time and space. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, we ask that you uh, embrace inside of us. You ask us to, to ask for your Holy Spirit to come and live within us. So Father, I pray for the filling of your Holy Spirit to overflowing may your holy spirit fill every crevice inside of us every part of our, our fiber of being every cell um every atom of our body so then what's coming out is just only you lord god we check our hearts father we we acknowledge that we are sinful bunch of sinful people and um god we only made holy and righteous by the grace that you showed to us the love that you poured by sacrificing your own son, your only son on a cross for us. So God, we don't take that for granted. We don't look at the cross as something that is normal and to just be joked around with. We acknowledge you, Father, as, as our Lord and our God. And imperfect as we are, Father, we repent, God, knowing that you know each and every fiber of our being, there is no place that we can be that your holy presence cannot be. Romans 8.38 reminds us there is no space we can be where you're not, uh, not above, not below, not to the sides, not around, everywhere. Uh, your presence is, your omnipresent. So God, we come to you uh, bare, transparent. Uh, we don't hide anything from you. It's you who's doing the cleansing. Uh, we're just willing vessels, imperfect willing vessels, but we come before you, Lord God, with the authority given to us by your son and God with the boldness that comes from knowing you. We know that we're a royal priesthood. We're uh, a collection of kings and queens, and we will rule together with you in that great day uh, when you come back for us. Thank you, Father, for making it possible to reconcile uh, to be reconciled back to you. We don't take that for granted. We are so grateful. We are always grateful. Every moment of our lives, we are grateful. And we bless you, Father, and we glorify you. We trade everything that we are, Lord God, for your glory. We trade our, our whole lives for you. God, we give up everything that's on this world um, in order to have you. Just as the, the Proverbs, just, just as the, the stories uh, that Jesus shared, um, all, the, all the stories that he was emphasizing how important the kingdom of God is, the parables. I thank you, Lord, that we have found something that is so precious, the salvation. And so we leave everything aside. God, we leave everything aside at your altar, at your altar of sacrifice. And then you say, God, that obedience is better than sacrifice. So then we are obeying you by following your word. Thank you for giving us such a precious moment to be together. 
a, a group of believers, a group of beloved brethren, to just be able to share heart to heart, one on one, on the messages that you give us. Thank you, God, for each and every person here. Thank you for every family that's being um, represented, Father, and be with each and every one of them. God, all the members of this great family of KGC, you know you're the, you're the one who began a good work in us and you will see it to completion. And we hold that truth by faith because we know that um, you're the author and perfecter of our salvation. Thank you, God, for the message. Thank you, God, for using your Holy Spirit, sending your Holy Spirit and using us uh, to speak your truth according to your word. It is a humbling honor. God, thank you. We are, we are so um, just grateful to be here. Take over, Holy Spirit. Father, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. For the 
This these words to this song, you know, we're just kind of trading uh, sorrows. We're trading our sickness. We're trading our shame. We're trading our pain. Everything. We're trading everything for the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord, as the scriptures say, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Okay, I sometimes tend to um, to kind of uh, engage my heart too much, which then what happens is then I run out of time to do exactly what I need to do. So I want to kind of um, re-engage my focus into today's topic, into all we're supposed to be doing. And before I do that, I just, I pray that you're all well in the Lord. Um, I know that we all have different circumstances at home. Um, and and if you're if you're suffering in any way, if you're in pain in any way, if you're if you're lost in some sort of you know form, maybe it's like you're lacking in some uh, in some way. Then you know I'm just gonna believe with you uh, this evening uh, that the Lord God who we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, He's gonna come through. He will come through. Uh, faith is not uh, believing that God will do something. Faith is knowing that God will do something, right? So just uh, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And if he cares about uh, little birds, uh, swallows, and if he cares about um, the lilies of the field, then how much more us? May I always be an agent that reminds people of just how much God loves us, how much, how much he loves us. You know, he loves us. He loves us. God loves us. He lavishes on us. We are the apple of his eye. And uh, yeah, as screw ups as we are sometimes, he's still, you know, like a, like a great parent, like the greatest parent. Uh, he never stops pursuing us. He never stops loving on us, no matter what. He's constantly just about you constantly about you and so i'm hoping that um today's devotion will serve as a reminder uh not only of the kind of love that god has for us but the kind of love we're supposed to have back towards him and not just towards him but also towards our neighbor but more importantly more importantly uh we're going to speak a little deeper about the relationship that we have with god so the one-on-one -on -one relationship we have with God, right? Because it's supposed to be, um, there's, a, there's a Salvation Army saying, I grew up in the Salvation Army church, and there's a Salvation Army saying, uh, from, from God to man, and uh, from God to me, and from me to mankind, all right? It's, so it, it's coming, the connection between God and you should be so uh, set, uh, so foundationalized, uh, so so permanent on the rock that is Christ Jesus, that then when you go out uh, spreading the gospel, reaching out to people in love, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself, uh, your family neighbor, your your gay neighbor, your non-believing neighbor, your your atheist neighbor, all the neighbors that God puts in your way, uh, then you can you can truly surely 
love them as you love yourself. I, I want to, to go right into the heart of the matter. Uh, today's devotions, I've titled it Serious Business. And before we start, um, I just want to say a quick prayer. Father God, thank you that your Holy Spirit is here with us. Your Holy Spirit is always with us. When we accepted you into our heart, your Holy Spirit came and dwells inside of us. So I, I pray that you guide every word that I speak. And Father, I pray that um, every heart that hears this message, may it be like a beautiful soil ready for a seed that is timely, right? May this word be as a seed and may the hearts out there listening to these words be as a fertile soil with good, good manure and built-in um, capacity to just receive the seed and then be able to produce much, much uh, harvest. Uh, the harvest is yours. We know that the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. But you're the God of the harvest and you'll bring the harvesters. So Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for each and every person here, every person who will ever hear this. Um, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, so as, as I speak to you this evening, um, I will focus on three important points. And I pray that, um, that this, this, these three points will guide you as you walk uh, with Christ for the rest of your life. As a master builder, um, I want to lay a strong foundation on which to place uh, this message purely based on the word of God. Now, we all know what happened at the Garden of Eden uh, with our forefathers, uh, you know, Adam, Adam and Eve, forefather and, and for mother, right? Uh, we have the Garden of Eden, we have paradise. And um, we're looking at a context where God has made everything perfect. And even he takes a look at his creation and says, yeah, you know, things are not just good. They are very good. God declared his creation very good. Well, um, in that very good creation, there happened to be uh, an enemy, an enemy of God. And unfortunately, we all know the story. He was able to convince Adam and Eve um, to do what they were not supposed to do, to be disobedient to God's exact commands. Um, and this is how death and, and the separation uh, of, of our bodies and our spirits enter into the world, right? Uh, when we're being disobedient with God, um, and I'm giving just in a general sense on we're being disobedient with God. Um, it says in the New Testament, disobedience is that as the sin of witchcraft, you know, disobedience is a huge thing. And, and God prefers, uh, another part of the Bible says, that obedience be better than sacrifice. So God, God rather, uh, he would rather have us obey him than sacrifice things for him. You know, we're very good at sacrificing things. We're very good at saying, oh God, I'm doing this for you. Or, you know, Oh, my family, I'm doing this for you. Oh, my friends, I'm doing this for you. Oh, my work, my workmates, my colleagues, I'm doing this for you. And, uh, and we're, we're set on kind of like uh, carrying that narrative. Yeah, we're doing this for people. We're doing this for people. And, and that's well and good. Yes, uh, we sh definitely should uh, um, aspire to do good things to people. But obedience, right? Obedience to God's word. Um, when it says... You know, just a simple thing, uh, don't tell lies, right? Uh, obedience to that word is better than any sacrifice you could give to God. Any amount of money or resources or time that you could provide to God is, is that will be nothing compared to you simply obeying him saying, don't lie, right? Uh, just a simple example. And so um, I, I want us to... Um, I want us to kind of focus on the reason why they ended up sinning, right? When the temptation came and they knew what they were instructed to do and they, they disobeyed, they disobeyed um, that's kind of how we all are. And, and I just want to, um, I just want to kind of like 
uh, read through the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter three. Uh, if you have your Bible, just uh, pull it up. Genesis uh, chapter three. And uh, we will look at Um, just a, a, a touch. I just want to just skim through this. I don't want to go too, too far into it. Um, just from the beginning of chapter three. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the creatures. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, your, you can read from whatever translation of the Bible you have. Um, yeah, now the serpent was the shrewdest, uh, shrewdest of all the creatures the Lord God had made. Really? Excuse me, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? How many times, how many times are you about to do something that is right or righteous? And you have this voice in your head saying, really? Does God really want you to, to give up your coat to that person? Does God really want you to give that, you know, 20 bucks to that homeless person? Does God really want you to write that check for, you know, $1,000 towards some mission field that God has placed in your heart? Does God really, is that really what God wants you to do? You have so many bills. How many hours did you put into getting that money? Is that really God? I, I think I'm going to speak for myself here. I, 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 I must confess that uh, I do hear that and, and, and I have to persevere through that. I have, to, I have to be obedient to God's Holy Spirit's prompting than what my flesh or what this voice inside my head is telling me, which is not of God. Really? He asked the woman. Did God really say that you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? Of course she knew. It's not that she couldn't eat any, or they couldn't, because Adam was there. They couldn't eat any of the fruit. Um, there was one fruit. There was only one fruit. There's only one fruit they were told not to consume of. And then right beside it was actually the fruit of eternal life. This is so close to home. And I, I, I just, I want us to walk together on this. I'm watching time very closely and I, and I want to get deeper, but not so deep that you get lost while not so uh, on the surface that you don't get anything from this talk. I want us to grow together, right? This is what devotions are supposed to be for. So soon after in Genesis uh, chapter four, um, you know, just kind of skimming along, we have the first murder in the first family here. Um, you know, and, and it's between brothers, Cain and Abel. You know the story. These are brothers from the same mother and father. And yet, and yet, right? Right off the, this is Genesis chapter four. We haven't, we haven't gotten through you know, uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and, and all the way to Revelation. We haven't gone anywhere. This is the very first book uh, of the Bible, of what God wanted to say to humanity, to you and I. This is what he wanted to say. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a problem, right? There's a problem right off the bat. And, um, it, and it's a, what, why? Why did Cain kill his brother? You know, you know this story. Go ahead. You can read it in verse six yourself. So as you can notice right off the bat, God does not play around with sin. God is not playing around with sin. And, and sin is just basically, you know, simple definition of sin is just dif disobedience. It, it's, it's, it's a rebellion from godly ways. That's all sin is, you know, um, Sin is, is just basically going on your own way that is not of God's, right? It goes as far, the Bible goes as far as saying that it is sin to know the right thing and not do it, right? So let's keep on going. So God will not have anything to do with sin because of his nature. God is holy. He must remain holy. 
Um, and so sin makes, makes us unholy. And so he will have nothing to do with sin. We have great news, but we have to hold on in order to get to the great news. This reality should cause each and everyone uh, who has reached the age of maturity to deeply consider the wages of sin. What are the wages of sin? We know this. We're mature Christians. We've been, we've been through this many, many times. The wages of sin is death. Simple, clear, and, and truth, right? Uh, it's very matter of fact. Uh, right from the beginning, uh, God shows us that the wages of sin is death. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is... Uh, we're going to keep going. You know these things. I'm not touching on things that we do not know. And I love that. I love that we're people who spend time in God's word. So then it, it doesn't... These things, they don't just kind of flow by us. You know, we, we know what they're talking about. We know what, what uh, the biblical um, uh, writers were saying through God's Holy Spirit. Um, let's move right down into Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Romans uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. And this is what it says. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation as I, I mentioned before. No, as the scriptures say, no one is good, not even one. No one has real understanding. No one is seeking God. All have turned away from God. All have gone wrong. No one does good, not even one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their speech is filled with lies. The poison of a deadly snake drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They are quick to commit murder. Wherever they go, destruction and misery follow them. They do not know what true peace is. They have no fear of God to restrain them. You would think that Paul uh, was talking to to non-believers, uh, but he's not talking to non-believers. As a matter of fact, in verse nine, it says, well then, are we Jews better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. Jew or Gentile, we're under the power of sin, right? Now, uh, he goes on to, to talk about uh, Christ taking on the punishment that uh, we deserve, you know, the wages of sin. However, it's good that they, uh, Paul decided to quote um, Psalms here when he was speaking about this, this particular uh, condition. You know, he's diagnosing the human heart, you know. Um, each human heart, not just, this is not a general statement. This is individually to each and every one of us. So um, I, I bumped into this piece of scripture right here um, one day when I was, I was camping. I, I love camping. I, um, I spent many, many years uh, with the Salvation Army uh, camping department, um, you know, working with, with young people from the Greater Toronto area um, every summer and then a, a little while, for, you know, as a full-time job. And I love being in the wilderness. I love being out in nature, you know, under, under the trees in the forest, you know, in my tent or, you know, in the middle of the lake with my canoe. I, that's just, you know, it's very strange, but that's, that's tranquility for me. And I remember this one time I, I woke up early in the morning and um, I was out. Uh, we had a group of young people. It, it was just maybe like 4, 4.30 in the morning or something like that. Everybody's still asleep. Uh, it's a beautiful summer day. It's still warm outside. Um, and I just I went uh, for a little walk and uh, there was a dock 
uh, just overlooking the pristine waters of, of Lake Victoria. Uh, this, is, this is up north, uh, bordering Algonquin Park, uh, near a little town called Madawaska. Anyway, so I, I took my Bible and, and I just, I sat at a dock and I was just watching out. Um, it was still dark, the sun had not come up and I was just gathering my thoughts. And uh, I brought my Bible with me. And, and so I, um, I wanted to just kind of jot down my, uh, some of my thoughts. So I, I, I went right to the back uh, of my Bible and I wrote um, what my thoughts were. Um, this is, uh, I, I did this thing, um, August, 2005. So quite a few years ago. And um, as I sat down and I read, uh, this is one of the scriptures that showed up. So in this backdrop of pure serenity, um, in this backdrop of just peace um, and tranquility, uh, where the lake is completely crystal clear and uh, all you can um, see is kind of like the reflection of the stars uh, into the sky. In that, in that moment, um, as I looked inside of myself and, and in, the, in light of my Bible, I read these words, uh, no one is good, not even one, you know, no one does good, not even one. And, and that, those words, they, they had a, a profound impact into my heart because I took them to heart, you know, and, and I said, God, your word doesn't lie. You know, your word tells the truth. And so this is me. I'm there. I'm, I'm the one who's been described here. And, um, and God, I, I pray for the antidote. You know, I, I pray for the redemption here. And, and I, I seek out Christ, you know, as my only source of salvation, um, you know, to wash away the guilt from my heart, to wash away my sins. I'm jumping in front of myself here. Um, what I wanted to say is, ladies and gentlemen, this is the reality of all of us. The sinful nature that we all carry, that's, that's who we are. The three points I want to, to share, I want to share with you, uh, if you want to jot them down somewhere, are, are, are this. Uh, number one, we are all sinners. That's plain and simple. We are all sinners, plain and simple. Number two, uh, we are in need of a savior. We're in need of a savior. And there's a journey that begins right after we accept this reality. Uh, believe in the name of the Lord and we shall be saved. When you, when you receive this salvation, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you, believe on, you, be, you become a new creation and, and there's a journey. You begin on a journey. So number two, we are in need of a savior. And number three, the one who created us for relationship as we speak, he is preparing a place for us. The one who created us, he created us for relationship and he is preparing a place for us. So this, in a nutshell, is the Bible's uh, gospel, that we have all gone astray, and God is wooing us back into relationship with him. I mean, from Genesis right after Revelation, you'll see uh, time and again, just God coming after us, you know, as wayward children, and also as, as disobedient or kind of like, you know, uh, unfaithful spouses. Um, and this is a, it's a serious offense. It's a very serious offense to God, um, being unfaithful to him or being wayward in our relationship. Um, and uh, so my guiding piece of scripture and the scripture for this evening uh, comes from the book of Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. And this is what it says. Dearest friends, you were always so careful to follow my instructions when I was with you. Actually, I'm going to read it from 
the King James Version, chapter 12. Uh, sorry, chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed not. Sorry, let me start again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'll read it again. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Maybe this is uh, a piece of scripture. Maybe this is one, one place. Um, pardon me. We don't get enough time to just kind of camp there. Uh, you know, take off the knapsack, you know, our backpacks. Uh, you know, in, in a sense, take off all the junk that's around us, all the distractions. Maybe this is a place we don't spend enough time in. Um, here we see Paul urging the Philippians and indeed the entire community of believers to really put first and forefront the reverence and respect that surrounds salvation. Salvation is nothing to be joked about. It's nothing to play around with. This evening, I will not be debating some of the matters such as the thought of once saved, always saved. Um, you know, kind of sermon? No, I really want to zero in on what Paul was trying to say. So many times when Paul wrote his letters, he would actually ask uh, the, the sister churches to share the letters amongst each other. So then, you know, the church, the Kenyan church uh, in Mississauga can, can read of what the Kenyan church in Toronto uh, received from Paul and vice versa. So then the church has always had these same messages, these letters, which are actually the New Testament uh, surrounding around them. You know, this is, this is why, just a, a little bit of track here, this is why it's mind boggling for me for people to say, oh, uh, the Bible, uh, especially the New Testament, it's unreliable because how can you prove that these things are real or true or whatever? Well, I tell you this, it's like, um, a, a letter you know, from a prominent member um, of society. And, and this letter, like a letter from the queen, you could say, and it's supposed to be read to all the people, all the subjects, all the royal subjects. And so it will be, it's bizarre and very weird if someone wants to say, oh no, the queen never said that because these letters, you know, the churches had them, you know, they had copies of the, of the letters. And most of the times actually, when Peter finished writing a letter, he would say, and it is I, Peter, with my own handwriting that I'm doing this, or he would sometimes say, okay, it's this person who I'm with that's actually writing for me. He would, he would tell you the truth. It's the truth, right? Uh, sometimes we don't take the, the word of God that literal and factual. And I think we need to go back to the basics. Anyway, that's enough uh, distraction. For anyone who struggles with exercising, uh, you know for sh how, how sure your body falls back to a state you don't want it to be. So if you get into a regimented uh, workout um, and you just kind of exercise, exercise, exercise for a period of time, you will see the, the, the results. You will start seeing the results. And after a period of time, yeah, you will definitely see results. But if you stop exercising, if you slow down on exercising, or if you take upon yourself to not care for your body anymore, um, whatever that looks like and sounds like for you, well, there is a natural um, kind of, uh, there's a scientific word for it. It's, I, I think it's entropy, but there's, there's a certain level of kind of decay that starts to happen. Um, and this is the same thing with our spiritual walk with Christ. You know, when, when we first, this is, when, this is why we're being urged at, at times to go back to our first love. You know, when we first received Christ, we had all sorts of fire and drive to just go and do everything that God wanted us to do. We were so bold. Our faith propelled us to reach out to everyone. And, and most of us probably prayed for so many people to receive Christ during that time. 
and maybe, just maybe, since then, you know, we've grown cold. Uh, just being honest here, you know, there's a season of my life when um, I definitely was not, uh, you know, living the way Paul was urging the Christians to live as trained athletes, you know, disciplined and on a mission, you're on a race. And, and it's obviously a race uh, against yourself. You're not racing against other Christians or other, you know, members of your family or, or anyone else. You're racing against yourself. And this salvation, this race, you know, it, it, it involves uh, spiritual discipline. It involves uh, spiritual maturity. It involves spiritual exercising, you know, reading your Bible, praying, fasting, uh, spending really quality time with God. These, these are the spiritual exercises that we, we must engage in. We must uh, be diligent about. You know, it cannot be something that we take for granted. Um, salvation is not to be taken for granted. You know, everyone will give an account for their lives on that great day of judgment. And therefore, we must clean with everything we have to the author and accomplisher of our faith. It's important. My brothers and sisters in faith, the one who is constantly accusing us is the very one that comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And this is why we have to put on our entire armor um, of, of, uh, of, um, of warfare. And this is based on Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, an armory. We have, we have shields. We have weaponry. We have helmets. We have belts. We have shoes. We have, we, you know, if you're looking at a modern day soldier, and this is kind of the reference that was being made, the, the, the Roman regiment, the Roman uh, soldiers were, were the, the, they were a machine. They were a well-trained killing machine. And so when, uh, Paul is giving us this picture of Ephesians. He's looking and he spent a lot of time <laughs> with the soldiers. Uh, many, many times he was chained between them. Uh, many times he was jailed. Many times he was whipped by them. Um, many times he was, you know, he was, he was just guarded by them. So he knew them. He knew exactly what they looked like. And his, his uh, explanation of how we are to protect ourselves or to go into the warfare, the spiritual warfare that we're supposed to be engaging in with a very formidable enemy is a full on armory, right? Uh, a soldier right now, if you look at, uh, you know, the, the Navy or like a SEAL, you know, a Navy SEAL, you know, the gear that they come with and, and the kind of, um, you know, uniform that they have and all the weaponry and all the gadgets and gizmos, it, it, you don't mess with a person like that. They're, they're ready. They can take out an entire, you know, village by themselves because they're, they're that prepared. And this is how the Christian walk is supposed to be. We're supposed to be uh, on guard spiritually. We're supposed to be, you know, in, in warfare mode. We're in a battle, you know, it's not a, you're not fighting against flesh and blood brothers and sisters you're fighting against principalities in high places and, and they're they're coming they're coming at us from all angles now god showed us just how much he loved us by dying for us so the question to ask here is who would you die for who would you be willing to die for you know your, your partner your family your children maybe a stranger on the street who would you die for? There are some critical topics mentioned in the Bible that we don't give the attention they deserve. I hope that this day you will make a resolve to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And then in the same token, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. This, this is the greatest commandment. This is what we're supposed to do. This is the whole call to Christianity, to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. 
Moses many, many times said to the Israelites, choose, choose. And then in Revelations, the words of Jesus, I would rather people be hot or cold, hot or cold. To the church of Laodicea, it says, because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You know, lukewarm. What does lukewarm look like? You know, lukewarm water. Mm, I think cold or hot. You know, lukewarm tea. Oh, lukewarm uji. Lukewarm coffee. Ah, just doesn't doesn't have the same, you know, some people have nest tea, cold tea. Okay, you know, hot, a cup of hot tea. Hmm, you know, a cup of hot cocoa, hot, hot chocolate, hot coffee, you know. This is the, this is how we are supposed to be. We're supposed to be the light of the earth, you know, salt of the earth. You know, we're, we're supposed to be shining bright, especially in this season. We're supposed to be all up in arms about doing everything that is right for God. How are you? You know, how's your walk with Christ? How are your devotions? You know, how's your private time with God? You know, obviously all of you here, I have to say you're serious because you could be anywhere doing anything, but yet here you are listening. You know, how's your, your Bible study? How do you read that? How is your, your prayer life? How do you talk to God? How's the relationship you have with others in comparison or in relation to how you are with God? These are critical questions. I hope that I've inspired you to, to look back, to remember your first love, to remember when you first got saved, and then just kind of if you if you're in a kind of place where you've kind of remained you know so so you know you're lukewarm you're you're neither hot nor cold you know check within your heart and and god can show you this if you if you've remained you know you're you're not sure footed in anything you know and and, and your your foundation is like a, a a house built on sand you know shifting sand well uh, my brothers and my sisters uh, that's not a good thing. We must be solid based on God's word. We must be pursuing everything God. We cannot let the world influence us. We are supposed to be influencing the world. And it's, it's through love. That's the key. It's through love. Love is the key. Love will conquer everything. Faith, hope, and love. Above all this is love. It is love, my brothers and sisters. It is love for God. Put everything aside. If, you're, if your right arm, you, you know, or, or your right eye, or your good arm, or your good eye causes you to sin, Jesus says, cut it off. Cut it off. You know, you're better off coming into heaven without an arm than not going into heaven at all. I don't know what what's causing you to to stumble this this evening i don't know what's causing you to to fall over and over again i don't know what your struggles are but god does but god does let me just pray and then um we we can move on uh, i see that it is 8 p.m thank you so much for staying here with me thank you father thank you holy spirit for being here Father, I glorify you and I give you praise. I give you all the honor, my Father, my God, Abba. I take on your armor, God. I take on your, your personality. It is no longer I who live, but you living in me. I'm crucifying my flesh. My flesh is, does not control me. It is your Holy Spirit. Lord God, I give, you, I give you glory. I bless you. Thank you for these people here. And thank you for their families. God, thank you for each and every heart that listens to this message. It is you who is working in us. We cannot do it on our own. Ah, I'm guilty. We cannot do it on our own. 
as your scripture says, no one is good. Not one. No one is looking after you. No one. No one is paying attention. No one is not even one. God, may we be counted different. May you change that reality in us. Father, when we are called into, into worship and, and prayer for the sake of the lost, may we be present. First, with our ourselves, with our relationship with you, and then with everybody else. Give us the courage to stand, Father. Give us the opportunities, God. Let your Holy Spirit lead us into all truth. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. God, may nothing distract us from zoning in into your heart. Like David, just people after your own heart. God, I pray for this journey that we are on right now. I pray that you'll be able to help us work out in a spiritual way, work out our, our prayer life, work out our fast life, work out our study life. God, work out how we are supposed to love our work colleagues and, and even those who are unlovable and reach out to the lost. Help us be able to just be so focused on what is your will, your good and perfect will in our lives. Just as everybody is, is different, fingerprints and all, Father, you made us like a key that can only fit into certain places. Each and every person here has a mission. You've called them for a purpose. Every one of them has a purpose. So, Father, I, I release them to perform their purposes, God. I release them to live uh, a life that is unafraid, unashamed, and unabandoned just reckless passion for you, God, and for those around them. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Father, for this space. I thank you, God, and I give you all the glory. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us like you do. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. We believe, Lord, and we accept. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray for blessings as, as we depart, God, as we go our ways, as people go back into their businesses tomorrow, the rest of the week, into the weekend and, and beyond. Go with them, Lord. Go with them. Your angels go before them. Father, Holy Spirit, just guide them. May we walk in truth and above all in love in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, 